racing now. I wish I win from last. A spectacular TJ win. Giga kick, giga kick down the outside. Wins the Everest. Shinzo and Brian Moore have drawn clear to win the Golden Slipper. With Tim Gilbert and Julie Snook, this is Racing Dreams. And it's where dreams come true. It's great to have your company. We are just a week away. Julie Snook from the Everest, Ooh, from the richest race on turf. Good morning, everyone. One week until Christmas Day. I'm so excited. But incredibly, we don't have a full field yet. We no. still have one slot remaining and a week to go. So there's lots to talk about this morning. We've got some great guests coming up. We'll be covering all things Everest. Take a look. Well, what a week. The final few chess pieces have almost been put into place ahead of next week's Everest Hawaii 5-0 is in and Adrian Bott joins us soon. Everest Day sees the best racing in the world. It also sees people having a bit of a party. <laughs> Superstars like Kelly Rowland have been on show. We're going to have a look at the entertainment and everything that goes with Everest Day. And our tour of magical New Zealand continues today. We go on a tour of the picturesque Elsdon Park. Have a look at that. Mm. This racing update is brought to you by Bet365, the world's favourite online betting brand. What are you really gambling with? Well, in just one week, we will be trackside ahead of the $20 million Everest. And joining us will be this gentleman. Shane O'Cast joins us live from the newsroom this morning, but he'll be trackside next week. Good morning, Shane. Uh, good morning, Julie. Morning, Timmy. Yeah, look, I hope the weather holds up for next week. It's been a fantastic spring as opposed to last year when it was very wet all the way through. And we've had some wet Everest in the past. The first mm. two were run on quite wet tracks. But look, so far, the weather's doing its part. Yeah, well, let's have a look at the Everest in just a tick because there's been so many chess pieces moving. But a huge race day today. The new uh, Hill Stakes. There's some really interesting horses on show in the Roman Consul. Yeah, well, I think the Roman Consul is going to be a, a fantastic race, one of the best races of the calendar so far because we've got eight horses in it. They're all colts uh, and they're all stadium prospects. I mean, any one of these horses could go to... start. Well, a lot of them will actually go to some of the top studs in the country in the years to come, and a couple of them might even be in the Everest uh, next year, maybe one this year, I don't know. But um, it is a very, very competitive race and uh, a lot of depth, uh, and there's some other fantastic races across the card. We've got a $2 million race in Sydney as well, plus another $1.5 million race, so... Uh, yeah, we're certainly in full swing towards the Everest. It is all part of the $87 million Everest Carnival here in Sydney. We have had a little bit of rain overnight as well, Shane, and it is a little bit cooler conditions today for the 10 race card. Well, it is a bit, but I, th I think the trackmen and most trainers and owners would be pretty happy to see uh, rain come during the week and then it to fine up on the weekend because you don't want these horses uh, racing on, uh, you know, really hard tracks or really wet tracks. So it's somewhere in that sweet spot at the moment for the horses and the trainers and, and obviously the general public like to see the sun and they're getting that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I heard the track... Uh, manager this morning say they were a six going into a five so it should be a perfect uh, um, race condition at Rose Hill Gardens Western Sydney love it today <laughs> but uh, let's have a look at what's happened during the week because Espiona um, we're going to hear from Peter Tyre of course is one of the owners of the slot the Chris Wallace slot they've gone with Espiona their own horse Hawaii 5-0 is in Shinzo on the back of the trial Mazu stays on the back of the trial well, look, I thought that the interesting horse to go in this week was obviously Hawaii Five-0. Uh, there'd been a lot of mail around that he was trialling exceedingly well and uh, he ran such a good race. I mean, he's almost knocked off the Everest favourite uh, last week. Gee, he was impressive. Uh, what a difference a year makes, though, guys, because he actually raced on, on this day last year in the Tap Craig and he was beaten, I'll get this right, 144.49 lengths he ran last. But it was, if you remember, it was a heavy 10. It, you would not have seen a worse track or heavier track at Randwick ever and this horse doesn't like uh, heavy tracks. But look, he's back. He's going tremendously well. And with the James McDonald to ride, Hawaii 5 has really jumped out of nowhere. So he's, he's certainly the dark horse, or he was a few weeks ago, the dark horse going into the Everest. But now he's going to be one of the favourites. It's such an open field this year as well. But as I said at the start of the show, still one slot to make their move. That is your long. Now, talk all week, they are likely to confirm alcohol free. Uh, do we have an update on that? Well... Not yet, and that's the strange thing because Alcohol Free, a four times Group One winner, a mare that they paid $10 million for, uh, ran a terrific race, I thought, last week. It was the best thing I've seen her do in a trial or a race, not that she's had many uh, since she's been down here. But I'm wondering why they haven't announced it yet, and maybe they will, maybe they 
will in the next half hour. But is it opening... Are they keeping their options open for another horse? I mean, do they want to see what happens in the Roman Consul today? What if Osmosis comes out, breaks the course uh, track record? What if something goes, mm. you know, with Imperatrix? She, you know, nobody's saying that Imperatrix is absolutely 100% going to stay in Melbourne. Um, what if they make an offer too good to refuse? I don't know. Maybe alcohol frees in, but why isn't she already... Yeah, I, I, I think that osmosis idea is not a bad one. I don't know whether osmosis is actually the actual art of seeing the future or not. It sounds like it is. But I know that Henry Field and Bjorn yeah. Baker are very keen. I think Imperatrix, from what I've heard during the week on The Quiet, is that uh, Imperatrix will stay in Melbourne, go to the Manicato and do that route. So, yeah, interesting to watch. Now, just on Melbourne, the Turnbull uh, Stakes today, Group 1 Racing, of course. We're seeing a, a, a superstar, international superstar there. Oh, that's right. That's added a lot of interest to the Turnbull, a romantic warrior. He's, he is the Hong Kong champion. He's the highest rated horse racing in Australia today. He's got a rating of 120. Uh, he's won 10 out of 14, was second three other times. He's an absolutely fantastic horse over 10 furlongs, so he's here for the Cox Plate. Uh, I did see James McDonald interviewed a number of times this week, and he kept reiterating, uh, reiterating that the horse would take improvement out of, out of this race, and he'd take improvement towards the Cox Plate, which I suppose is a little bit of a worry, but by the same token, he probably wouldn't have to be 100% to win, albeit mm. against the good field, but he is a superstar horse. Well, speaking of Hong Kong, Huey Bowman's back from Hong Kong to ride Espiona. We've also got Zach Purton making the uh, the trip down here for his very first Everest. Karen McAvoy has been confirmed to ride Shinzo. Not that Karen's overseas, but how important is it to have these jockeys back here for these big race days in Sydney? Well, it's it's very important for these um, for the individual trainers to know that they've got a jockey who's been there, done that, because the Everest uh, is you feel the butterflies before the race, not just for the prize money, but the build-up is so huge. So you want these jockeys that have ridden in major races. And if you think about Hugh Bowman, I mean, the, the pressure that Hugh Bowman must have mm. felt every single time he rode Winks um, was enormous and he always came through. Uh, Zach Purton's been on the big stage in Hong Kong and, and other places. Uh, Kieran McAvoy's already ridden three Everest winners and three Melbourne Cup winners. So, yeah, you want to make sure that uh, your jockeys um, got their wits about them uh, going into a $20 million race. Mm, absolutely. Now, talking about pressure, <laughs> you uh, came to the party with Militarised <laughs> last week. Well, um, what about this week? OK, but I've got to be careful. My bosses watch this show, so... <laughs> I've got to start getting a few winners up. Look, the, the $2 million hill stakes today, it's a fantastic race. Uh, I think uh, Chris Lees uh, has the winner. Race seven, number six, a horse called Protagonist. Uh, he won the sky high stakes at his first run here in Australia. He was a little bit disappointing after that, but his last uh, two runs leading into this, or he, certainly his last run, was he put the riding on the wall. So, um, yeah, Protagonist, we need him badly. Yeah, Ben English, um, Tim Morrissey, write that down. <laughs> write that down. Good, good morning. Good telegram. morning. I know they love it. Good to see you, Shana. OK, thanks. Have a great day, everyone. This racing update is brought to you by Bet365, the world's favourite online betting brand. Imagine what you could be buying instead. Well, the Bot Waterhouse stable is absolutely flying at the moment. What a Saturday they had oh, last week, Jill. Absolutely. George. Four wins, three seconds and a third. And they had a training trifecta in the Breeders' Plate as well. Not a bad day at the office. Joining us now on Racing Dreams is Adrian Bot. Good morning to Adrian. Yeah, good morning, Julie. Good morning, Tim. Spoke to Jerry Harvey during the week. He's pretty happy. Hawaii 5 0. Book him, Dano. You're into the Everest. Tell us. Yeah, f fantastic result. Um, I, I must say, that was their dream. Um, the minute he went over the finish line in the, uh, in the Stradbroke, Singo and, Singo and Jerry were hatching a plan to, to get him into the Everest. Um, you know, I thought we had a, I must admit, I thought we had a task ahead of ourselves at that point in time. Um, but they've, They've stuck solid and um, we've prepared him that way. We've put him on that path and um, the Colts done the talking. Um, he, he was so impressive there in, in the Premier Stakes last start uh, and I feel he's right on track. So I'm really, really excited for him. Hopefully we can, we can pull it off. Well, Gay's done a bit of talking as well because she was really excited about him leading into that race and she's sort of been quite bullish about his capabilities and said that we haven't seen the best of him yet. Yeah, that's, that's very true. There's no doubt the horse has got so much uh, potential going forward. He's got the real, um, he's got the real X, X factor about him. Um, we, we sort of knew going into his first up run that he was going to take uh, significant improvement. We saw that. Uh, certainly feel we can see that once again. Yeah, nothing like a windblower to uh, <laughs> get us going. Um, <laughs> l last Saturday was just a, a great day. Uh, Julie outlined, you know, four wins. Um, how do you reflect on uh, last Saturday? You had a microphone in, in front of your face a lot. 
yeah, look, it's probably been hard to sort of take a moment to, to um, sort of sit back and reflect that the pressure's always on. Uh, you know, that week's behind us pretty quickly, and, and here we are sort of looking at the, the build-up to the Everest. So you, you move on move on very quickly. Um, there's always sort of plenty of horses to keep preparing for their next targets, and, um, yeah, they, they, they sort of looking forward to, um, to that next sort of big race for us. Well, it's good that the stables will be clean Everest week because obviously that's happening behind you now. But on the Everest, um, we still have one slot remaining. A lot of talk about alcohol free this week and whether you along would be picking her for the race. Have you got any intel for us? Uh, look, my, my lips are sealed. I'm, unfortunately, I don't have any, um, any breaking news here for you. Um, look, we've certainly made the recommendation that that's where we'd love to, to see the mayor. Um, yeah, I think very similarly to... What we saw with Hawaii Five O, there's significant improvement off her first up run. I thought she was she was excellent going into that race. Um, you know, the second up, she's she's going to perform uh, much sharper, much better. And just the the setup of that race in the Premier Stakes didn't necessarily suit her. She had a uh, sort of bit of a slowly run race. I feel she needs a bit of pressure on there just to help her settle and find a, a better rhythm. She was a little bit fresh, just sort of not having raced for for a while. But um, she looks in in really good shape. Um, I'm very confident if she can. She can take her place. She'll she'll make make them proud and, and run very well. So um, waiting for the final decision from them. Um, like like everyone, we're in, in suspense, and I guess that's all part of the theatre of the race, isn't it? So um, hopefully we can see her take her place. Yeah, no, and of course the news during the week that Vin Cox is going to Yulong from mm -hmm. Godolphin across to Yulong. That happens at the end of the year. I've got a funny feeling that alcohol free might just be there next week, but uh, we'll wait to see what happens through the course of this week. Now. Uh, another a good mate of our show is mate of mine as well, James Harron. He was, he was cock a hoop about espionage and uh, the Breeders' Plate. Uh, look, the Breeders' Plate, the Jim Crack, the Colts and the Phillies, the two-year-olds. We see superstars come from that, uh, from both those races, and we've seen it over the past few years. What did you think? Uh, I thought he was excellent. Um, he, he's a real um, classy and quality individual. Obviously, um, you know James. Thought that selecting him out of the sales, paying a paying million dollars for him. So he's one of the, you know, the top class horses out of that Magic Million sale. And uh, to see him race up to that, um, you know, certainly very satisfying for the, um, for the stable. And, and for James, he's a um, you know, great, great friend, but a great supporter of the stable. He's got some loyal, um, loyal owners that sort of chip in each year to try and find these staying prospects. So um, a race like the Breeders' Plate there is a re really important target for them. Uh, it's been a great form reference for those, um, you know, for those future stallions going forward. So um, I, I think he's got a really, uh, really nice cold on his hands here. So really, really exciting for him in that regard. Uh, for those that don't know, the Bot family are a bunch of overachievers, really. And while you were, you know, cleaning up last weekend, your wife was out there winning at Equimillion, this brand new event, this brand new concept. And it's great to see her doing well out there. Yeah, she was so proud, and um, yeah, I was I was so proud of her as well. Very pleased for her. Uh, I was out there able to support her on on, on Mondays for go the uh, Warwick Farm races. So it was easy to get out there and see her see her do so well. She put a lot of lot of time and effort into this horse. She uh, sort of picked her out of the rehoming program of, of Race New South Wales, sort of going back uh, four or five years now. And she's just been a um, brings her so much. You know, you can see the happiness that she she brings her, and um, she just sort of decided in the last last sort of six months or so that she was really going to start competing um, sort of competitively again on her. And, um, yeah, she's, she's done very well. So, mm. um, you know, faultless, faultless round there on, on her on the day. And, yeah, excellent result. Yeah, absolute superstar Jess Bott, of course. Adrian, what a few days it was last weekend across the long weekend for you. Who you are, Mel, today in the Hill Stakes? Yeah, I think it's a lovely race for him. Um, nice setup. Uh, really just looking forward to getting him out and trip. And we sort of had the option of running in the Epsom there last week, but decided to hold him over. Just It would have been his third run at the mile. It might have been a bit too sharp for him. So getting out and trip now, uh, that's certainly the key. If he can settle that little bit closer, I certainly feel it can be very, very effective, but he's no doubt he's a, a classy horse going forward. Well, Adrian, great to catch up with you. We really appreciate your time, especially on a race day. A big week ahead with the Everest approaching. We'll see you at one of the many events. And, of course, Tuesday night, the barrier draw, the all-important barrier draw. So we'll see you then. I look forward to it. Thanks for having us on the show. Well, Chris Waller and his fellow slot owners know what it takes to win an Everest. Timmy, they have done it a couple of times already. They sure have, Julie. <laughs> Saluting with both Yes, Yes, Yes and Nature Strip. This year, they will be hoping Espiona can get the job done. Peter Ty owns part of the slot, and I caught up with him on the Gold Coast for Racing Dreams.
Well, Chris Waller, of course, he's got his footprint all over Australia and right here on the Gold Coast. I'm at the Chris Waller Gold Coast Stables and, of course, uh, Mr Gold Coast when it comes to horse racing. Peter Ty, how are you? Yeah, good, Tim. How are you, mate? I'm well. We'll talk about the Brisbane Broncos later because last time you were on our program uh, you hadn't made the grand final. That's all happened. We'll talk about that later. But the big news this week is Espiona. Um, of course, you're part of the Chris Waller slot for the Everest. You've gone with Espiona. Yeah, no, we're very, very happy to uh, have Espiona. We've tried for a lot of horses over the last few months and um, there's been a lot of injuries and dropouts and negotiations have been very fierce. Um, but we've had a lot of fun uh, with a lot of the uh, trainers and, and, and owners of uh, some of these horses and uh, finally ended up with Espiona, so really happy to have her. It's a real game, isn't it? And we've seen it written up in, in the Telegraph this week with the, with the special. It's extraordinary, the chess game that goes on when it comes to the Everest. Oh, it does. I mean, um, you know, we're great mates with Max Whitby and Neil Werrett and um, we know everybody that's got a slot and uh, there's lots of banter. We run into each other at the races or around the place and we're all trying to uh, beat each other to, to get the best horse. So, um, yeah, it's a, great, uh, it's a great concept and uh, it, it really brings racing to a new light. Well, we have the, the Winx combination, of course, Waller, you guys, uh, Peter Ty and, of course, the other owners of Winx are uh, all part of the slot for the Everest. Huey Bowman on board. Yeah, no, we've been lucky enough to secure Huey. He's uh, now based in Hong Kong. Um, couldn't be more than happy to have him. He's riding in superb condition at the moment. He's, I think he's leading the Hong Kong Premiership over there. So there's a great battle between him and Zach Purton, and I think Zach's coming out as well. So we're going to have an international lineup of jockeys in the greatest race, the greatest sprint race in the world. What was it like winning it? You've won it twice. Uh, let's first look at Yes, Yes, Yes uh, with uh, Bossy on board. It, it just came from nowhere. Yeah, well, it did come from nowhere. We had a, a horse lined up which dropped out 10 days before the race. And um, as a fill in, we thought we'd give Yes, Yes, Yes under Chris's instruction um, that he'd run well. Um, and he got a late call up to get in and blew them all away. So. The beauty of this race is that there isn't, are no rules and uh, everyone has a chance. We saw Nature Strip lead them out in the Premier Stakes, now retired, but uh, his win, what a horse. Yeah, well, we had him for two years. We had him run first and then he ran fourth last year. Um, you know, he, he just was, it was a great horse to have because he was such an icon of the sprinting ranks and uh, by golly, it was a thrill when he won, let me tell you. You've still got lots of horses here on the Gold Coast in Sydney as well and in Melbourne. Uh, Vienna Princess is probably the pick, uh, a good win the other week. Where, where could she end up? Well, she's a, a, probably our rising star at the moment. She's been lightly raced, four-year-old mare, uh, has come back in great form. Um, Chris has nominated for several races in Sydney and Melbourne and hopefully she measures up for the Spring Carnival in Melbourne and that's where we'd like to be. All right, finally, let's talk rugby league, something you and I both love as well and I've worked in it for many, many years. How did you feel when Ezra Mam, I'm going to break this down, how did you feel when Ezra Mam had scored his hat-trick? Well, it was the greatest feeling in the world. I mean, we, we were thinking how many we'd win by. Uh, you know, we, you can always get cocky sitting in the stands. But, uh, the boys had done a great job, defended well, everything worked out, and he just kept scoring one after another after another, and uh, we just couldn't have been happier. It was just elation after elation that we were playing the, probably the best rugby league team in the world and for 10 minutes giving him a hiding. And then you're in the dressing rooms because you're very close to the Brisbane Broncos. You're in the sheds afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it was very... Um, like, the, the boys took it hard, uh, which you'd expect. Um, but they're a young team. They're emerging. I mean, I'd, you know, if it was a young, a young race horse, you'd, you'd like to be backing them for the next two or three years because they're going to be they're going to be something special. They're a very special group of blokes, um, or young men, and um, they're going to take uh, the Broncos to great heights. Yeah, absolutely. And Kevin Walters did say that in the, in the post-match uh, media conference that he reckons over the next few years, watch us, we'll, we'll win some grand finals. But back to, back to these guys, aren't they beautiful? The horses, every time I, I come to stables, and obviously we look in the backyard of my place, very lucky to have a few horses there. They are just majestic athletes. Wait, they are. I mean, you, you, know, you, you can bring your kids here and everybody loves a horse. And the, the horses are as friendly as anything. Um, you know, and they're, they're well looked after. The staff here and, and all over they do a fantastic job with these horses. They're, they're groomed, they're well fed, they're well looked after. And um, they like to get on TV occasionally and, um, and uh, see what the camera's doing. Here he is, he's coming over to say good day. Uh, have a great uh, rest of the spring, Pete. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tim. Thanks very much.
Well, there's a new event making its taboo next week or this week, and it's a topic very close to both of our hearts. I'll say more for me than uh, anything. Food, glorious food. Where's Oliver when you need him? Uh, Taste of Turf makes its debut on Wednesday. This is such an incredible concept. The brains behind the concept, Karen Scott Harper, joins us live this morning with Paula Toppy. Good morning to you, ladies. Lovely to see you. Morning. Good morning to you. Karen, tell us what is Taste of Turf? Taste of Turf originated in the tennis world 23 years ago in New York City. And I am an Aussie, but I live in, in New York. And the concept is a mobile feast. We have food from all over the world and it's from table to table. Um, we started off in tennis, as I said. We just had our 23rd anniversary in New York. Uh, the food was fabulous, but it's nothing like the food you are going to have in the wink stand at Royal Randwick next Wednesday. We have the most fabulous array of chefs, 24 tables. It's a mobile feast. You'll go from table to table and oh. sample anything from fresh oysters to some of the fabulous Italian food that Paula's going to uh, cook now and cook fresh on the night. And it's food from all over the world. No one is going to go away disappointed. And to use the local expression, there are plenty of watering holes with the <laughs> finest of wines and cocktails. Yeah, Don't I, worry, I've looked at the sponsor list. <laughs> my, well, I've been here since five. I've been I've been here since five o'clock this morning, so you can imagine my stomach is grumbling. But uh, come on, Paula, show us what you got. What What are you going to cook for us uh, this morning? Because there's been an enormously wonderful reaction from chefs right across this great city. Well, the, I'm going to cook exactly what we're going to have on the night. So we're going to cook on the night uh, uh, live cooking station. And I'm going to show you what we're going to do here now. So we're just going to start very quickly. We're going to make a gnocchi sorrentina and a penne bolognese. Oh, you make so that sound easy. Burn it, so we're going to... Yeah, it is. Everything I do is easy. Well, it's easy when you're as good as you are. And don't forget that uh, if you <laughs> want to get tickets to this, it is tasteofturf.com.au. It'll be a wonderful night at uh, the Wink Stand on Wednesday night. And, and I think the jockeys are going to come around. And um, is that right, Karen, as we watch uh, Paula They're do her cooking? Such... The jockeys are going to be the That's waiters. That's true. The, the jockey, uh, no, the jockeys, are, uh, jockeys and trainers mm. are going to join the chefs. And, and present the food to the public. It's going to be fabulous photo ops for anyone who's involved. <laughs> now, I know you've lived overseas for many, many years, Karen, as you said, but you are a very proud Aussie. How do our restaurants and our chefs compare to those in New York? I think Sydney has the best food. Melbourne's very good too in the entire world. Uh, because they use the freshest ingre ingredients and the chefs are the most creative in the world. I really think so. Well, we love to cook fresh food, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, and here we go. We've got the, we've got the beautiful gnocchi and uh, the second... That's, uh, yep. That's the bolognese and that's the gnocchi. And it's qu really quite quick because um, we just cook it fresh to order. So as soon as the pasta is hot, we'll pull it out oh. and we'll have the induction cooking stations on the night so that will help and Paula just as I'm you sorry keep... your studio I'm... I said I'm sorry your studio is so far away <laughs> yeah. because it's just too much <laughs> for all of us to eat <laughs> <laughs> don't say that <laughs> I'm starving as well Paula just as you keep cooking there tell us from your perspective um, from your fellow colleagues and chefs in Sydney what's the reaction been to this event Look, I everyone. Have... Sorry. Go yeah. on. So everyone's very happy to be doing the event and to be at the inaugural event and to be part of the inaugural event. And hopefully, we'll be going for the next 23 years too. And I oh. think it's a great, um, a bit of bit, great publicity for after, especially after COVID, for restaurants to come back into the spotlight and show people that uh, showcase their their wares, as, as so to speak. And I think with the mixture of people that Karen's put together, it's going to be amazing. So quickly, where's your restaurant at? Before I ask Karen one last question. We're in Martin Place. We're at 60 Martin Place, at the top of Martin Place, just near Parliament House. So okay. Look out! Look out for a family nice of five. Close. Look out for a family of five coming in there shortly. <laughs> I'll be the one with the pink carnation. Karen, it is uh, tasteofturf.com.au. And in, in your 20 words or less, tell me why it's going to be such a magical evening and people should buy tickets. Because Sydney people love to party. This is one great big party. 
interspersed with 25 of the best restaurants in Australia, fabulous chefs, jockeys and trainers serving it. It's a win-win for all round. Believe me, you don't last 20 three years in New York City with this same concept unless you're doing something right. So this is our inaugural year here and we will be back every year and it will just get better and better. But uh, I am just so grateful to all the chefs and the variety and food that they have produced. It's fabulous. And I'm just sorry you're not here now because so are we. <laughs> smell this. If you could smell this, it's just that fabulous. Looks, that looks absolutely oh, yeah. sensational. No one here is sorry as I am. <laughs> Uh, ladies, thank you so much for your time this morning. This is exactly what you'll be seeing at the Wing Stand on Wednesday night for Taste of Turf, the inaugural event. Um, Paula, Toppy and Karen Scott Happer, thank you so much for your time this morning and good luck at the thank event. We really was a want pleasure. you to do well. We thank hope you very so much. too. Thank you very much for your time. Thank bye you. bye. Mm, bye bye. Everyone's a winner. That Bye. looks so good. Yeah. Oh, that looks delicious. Absolutely. We're going to have a fantastic night on Wednesday. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been bringing you stories from Julie's time in New Zealand. Yeah, that's right. This week, we want to take you to the heartland of New Zealand's famed horse country, where you'll find pristine rolling pasture. It's absolutely stunning. Elsdon Park is a new name in the game, but the people behind it are very well known. Elston Park is in the heart of the thoroughbred industry in New Zealand, we like to think, in a place called Matamata, so sort of central New Zealand, central North Island. The thing that sets this property apart is the undulating hills and the beautiful pastures, you know, that have been well established and maintained over the years by the Hickman family and obviously we're taking that through now and putting our own stamp on the property. The goal for us is to raise sound, strong athletes and this is the perfect property and, and ground to be rearing those horses. I think New Zealand is really well known for how we rear our horses in the most natural way possible. It builds strong bones, strong natural muscle. It's not steep terrain but it's just lovely rolling land so it's not putting too much pressure on those young foals joints either. Um, and we have a nice mix of nice flat land as well so whatever sort of we need we can accommodate which is pretty cool and, and you can make it a bit more individualised. Elson Park's owned by Lib and Katrina Patania. Lib is essentially a Wellingtonian businessman. Lib is a very well known in the racing industry. Um, his colours have been on the likes of Lucia Valentina, Sofia Rosa, incredible number of Group 1 winners and, and top race horses. It was a natural progression to buy a property. The broodmare numbers were increasing and it's a nice place we can spell our race horses as well, which is obviously, you know, a big love for Lib too, racing his horses. This was formerly owned by Valachi Downs and they've just done an incredible job. There's two properties that have been put together and yeah, the facilities are amazing. Lib wants to put his stamp on it and make it the way he wants it and so we're making changes and, and things that we see fit. It's actually just amazing just essentially starting a new business, building a new brand and whilst Alzen Park is a new name, you know, Lib Patania under his JMO Racing Colours is pretty well known in the industry. So we haven't we haven't started from scratch and we're not newbies to the industry, it's just a new name. When we took over 1st of August uh, last year, we put in a brand new parade area for our yearlings. So that was obviously first on our list because it was the upcoming sales and we wanted somewhere amazing where we could take people and, and you know show off our incredible yearling draft for Karaka. Put in a new folding unit. We've done quite a bit of work in 12 months, so it's been pretty full on, but they're all changes. We sort of settled in a little bit and then worked our, our way through things. And, and we've got a few ideas up our sleeves, just some pretty cool entertainment areas and places where we can bring our clients and our friends, you know, and host them on this amazing property. Essentially, we're setting these horses up to be able to perform at their best. You know, we're giving them every opportunity through nutrition, through you know the way they're raised, like our people are just 
I truly believe our people are second to none. We're big on positive horsemanship, so we don't knock the horses around. Like, you want a bit of fight in your horses. We want them to fight on the racetrack. We don't want to take away that will to win. It's just about that constant handling, being positive with each other, and safety as well. The business aim is to be breeding in that top quartile, you know, um, top end of the market. We go to some of the top Australasian stallions, send our mares like Lucia Valentina, she's a triple group one winner, and she's left a group one place fully already at just four foals. You know, Sophia Rosa, Nicoletta, Zanaya, we've got an incredible broodmare band. Our goal, we want to be known as good people, transparent to deal with, and genuine breeding sound horses that are super fast. Welcome back to Racing Dreams. Well, plenty of dreams have come true right behind me here. We're at the Gold Coast Turf Club and uh, the race day in January, the Magic Millions is absolutely wonderful. You will remember at the start of this year, torrential rain on the Gold Coast and we didn't quite get to see the full race day. But on the Monday after that, a renovation started and it's almost complete. It's looking absolutely sensational. And with that, I'd like to welcome to Racing Dreams the Managing Director of Magic Millions, Barry Bowditch. Barry, uh, I love that, looks great. Oh, we're so excited to get back here. Obviously, the, the Star Magic Millions Carnival is the biggest carnival here in Queensland. It's, it's, it's something we're excited to get a part of again and to have more prize money than ever before. You know, 15 million, I think, this, this coming January, 11 races on the big day on an unbelievable course proper. It's going to be great for our participants, for our clients and, and, and all race goers. We are just a week away from uh, the big one, uh, the Everest, the richest race in the world on turf and from Magic Millions perspective you've got some of your graduates on Broadway. Exactly, you know we've got uh, SP owner for Star Thoroughbreds, Private Eye for the Proven Thoroughbreds team and uh, In Secret for Godolphin so looking forward to the race, it's always a great race and uh, it's a race we've taken home some three times in the past so hopefully a Magic Millions graduate can do it again. Barry you've started uh, with your school shoes on in this industry. Your dad was a trainer on the Gold Coast. You went to Inglis as a 17 year old. Can you tell us a little bit about your time in this game? Yeah, started in nappies actually, Tim. So, um, <laughs> you know, to, to grow up in a great game like this and to, to, to progress through it, whether it be from a racing perspective, a breeding perspective, to, 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 to be around horses and to be around great people that, that love the game so much is, is, is something that, you know, I love and I know our team loves each and every day. It's, a, it's, a, it's an industry of passion and, 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 you know, we're all in it together to, to, to love the horse and to ensure we're, um, we're moving this industry forward. Yeah, that's so true. People in this industry, you need to love the horse first, no matter what capacity you're working in. But you have you started in Inglis as a 17-year-old. You had some great mentors in people like Vin Cox, the Inglis family, and now Jerry and Katie. Exactly. You know, I've... Uh I've been very fortunate to start as a boy at 17 at Inglis's and to, to work with Vin and be, grow a great friendship with Vin's been fantastic and, and then to be employed by Jerry and Katie and to be here at Magic Means for almost 20 years, it's... Uh, you know, I've, I've learned a lot and I've got some great people around me that, uh, you know, you can learn a lot off and to be able to use Jerry and Katie as, as mentors, as sounding boards, as, as well as bosses is uh, something that, you know, I, I, I treasure each and every day. We all get excited when we think of January, it's party time, but it's also an amazing racing time and all the big stars come to the Gold Coast. Uh, what do you got for us in 2024? Well, there's no better racing carnival worldwide than Magic Millions to bring your family here and, you know, yes, it's a sale, it's an unbelievable sale, it's an unbelievable race day, but what the Gold Coast in Queensland, you know, presents you with is fantastic weather, um, a great carnival vibe, whether it be the polo and the show jumping or, you know, the events all week, it's... it's it's, it's really exciting and we look forward to bringing everyone back here and showing them a great time each and every year. Is it still the same instruction from Katie? What do you got for me this year, Barry? Bigger and better, apparently. So, uh, you know, you never know what we, what 2024 holds. We're excited to, to, to have this Gold Coast Turf Club, to have a beautiful course proper, obviously, and, and a bigger and better race day. Obviously, each year we, we, we keep increasing our race series, but just to be able to bring everyone back, and I think the sale itself will be something huge in January. I think we'll have more horses, we'll have a stronger catalogue, and uh, with that, we should have some fireworks in the sales ring as well as here on the racetrack. Absolutely, and Magic Millions is such a great name because it also sort of 
makes you think about aspiration and you don't need to be the wealthiest person on the street to get involved. We can see it with the Everest and, and some of the syndications and, and, and people who are just going about their lives who could make all this money because they just got into horse racing. Exactly, in January there'll be horses making 10, 20, 30,000 all the way through to the big numbers. So, you know, we encourage people to come along, get involved, enjoy the vibe. Um, yeah, the syndicator market here in Australia is so, so good now. So anyone can be involved in this great game and there's no better, better country than Australia to race horses in. You'd have a very happy Jerry Harvey at the moment with Hawaii 5.0 with what Alligator Blood's doing. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. It's a horse he's bred. Obviously, it's, he's a full brother to Libertini, which was a mare that was close to Jerry, having run into Everest. And uh, to, for him to be qualified for the Everest and be a, to, to have a slot now, it's, it's fantastic. It was a lovely horse. Horse were very disappointed we didn't get to sell, but uh, Singo got under our guard and bought half of him. So for two great mates to race a really promising horse together, um, you know, looking forward to and, and obviously cheering him on in the Everest. Well, if you've ever been to Royal Randwick or Rose Hill Gardens during the carnivals, you know that after the last race is run, the party really gets started. You'll see my mate here in the mosh pit. Hey, I don't think so. <laughs> um, what, maybe 30 years ago. Uh, the man behind a lot of the entertainment, of course, uh, is George Moskos. George does a lot of the work behind the scenes, lining up people like Kelly Rowland <gasps> and Justin Derulo over the years. He's in the studio. Jason. How are you, George? Jason. <laughs> Dad. <laughs> I'm but Justin was there. <laughs> Justin Derulo, his cousin, was actually a stagey. That's no, Jason exactly right. Derulo. That yeah, yeah. goes to show how rock and roll I am. <laughs> um, but tell us about it. Like, oh, it's, it's good fun. It's really great fun. We're, we're getting ready to announce the, uh, the Everest's entertainment tomorrow. Very, very excited to be able to release that info shortly. But the teams of people, the artists that we get to bring for the show is, uh, is like no other. You know, it's like we get international people and, and all their management now are actually even knocking on our door to actually and vying for that spot because mm. uh, it's uh, really positioned itself as a terrific entertainment opportunity. How much has that post race day entertainment changed the atmosphere in your opinion of the race days? Because now people don't just get out of the track. They are sticking around. They're yeah. going down to the mountain yard there at Royal Randwick and it is a it's a party. It's huge. Yeah, no, it's it's quite incredible. Theatre of the Horse is set up amazingly. It's just immaculate. People are in the pit there just having a great time. But the fabulous part is mm. looking up over the balconies yeah. and the buildings that are surrounding because there's people dancing just all across all the balconies as well. So it's a it's a real spectacle. They make, they make it really good fun. That's and my hiding spot after a few champagnes so yeah, no one yeah. can see me doing the little suitcases. <laughs> have, a few, have a few more champagnes. Yeah, it is. We'll have a look at some of the vision of it because it is a, it's a party atmosphere. The, the racing is, is off the charts. And uh, Look at the uh, crowds. You know, I had a, had a moment, minor moment there where by calling him Justin Derulo, but of course Jason Derulo, I do know him, and he's the judge on The Voice and all that. But yeah. you've had some fantastic acts um, over the course of time, yeah. peaking duck as well. Yeah, yeah, rudimentally you got on screen at the moment too. They, they actually released new music at the Everest last year as well, and this year's entertainment will be doing the same as well. So the artists themselves are collaborating with another electronic outfit called Panau and they're going to be releasing some new music this coming Friday. So really excited to see that drop exclusively with the Everest. Mm. Oh, so hint, really hint. Great. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, tomorrow morning on the Sunday, in the Sunday Telegraph, we can't give it away, but have a look at the paper tomorrow because the, the uh, entertainment will be in there. So tell us, what do the artists think of the day? Obviously, you spend a lot of time with them in the lead up to the event and yes. on the day itself. Um, I was absolutely beside myself the year I saw Kelly Rowland warming up, um, having her rehearsals in the morning. Yeah, uh, it, we're just bringing some huge names here. So what do the artists think of it? Yeah, well, actually, funny you should mention, so Kelly and uh, Justin, Jason, <laughs> our mate Jason, uh, Kelly and Jason both hadn't actually met horses before or sat on a horse before. Mm. And so uh, I saw you had Adrian Bott on it earlier. Yes. He'd been very, very uh, supportive and, and very hospitable and had allowed for the artists to come down to their stables. Wow. To the point where they even hopped on a horse as well. So we had, uh, we've got some footage of, uh, you know, rudimental, the boys hopping on horses last year. 
Kelly. We didn't get footage of her, but she hopped up. And Jason Derulo as well. He, he hopped up on a horse as well. And That's amazing. None of them had even been in contact with horses before. So, mm. you know, they were really intrigued about the Everest and they were really motivated to uh, meet the horses too. Yeah, so lovely. it's very exciting. Apparently and... Jason and Justin both got on board. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Kelly Roller, my favourite. I remember meeting her at a hospital. We were doing a story for the telethon years ago. Oh, yeah. And what a delightful person. But, George, Beautiful. congratulations on all the work you've done. Big announcement you, tomorrow. And uh, Thanks, we'll God. be there uh, rocking and rolling next week. Can't wait to see you. <laughs> I can't All right. wait to see that either. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> Stay uh, with uh, us George coming us. after the break. You just missed the dad moves. Stay with us coming up after the break. Brad is back. Speaking of dad moves, his hot tips for today's fashion of Rose Hill. <laughs> Racing returns to Rose Hill Gardens today. Brad Gray joins us live, the male model from Miranda, ladies and gentlemen. A 10 race card today, buddy. Oh, I thought you were going to say you look like a 10. Well, you can say that. We Thank does. you, guys. Well, look at this. He's full, of, he's full of compliments this morning. Happy days. My two favourite people to talk to every Saturday morning. Yeah, so, yeah, we are at Rose Hill today. So, it's, I guess it's a little bit of a come down from last week, which was the Epsom. But you look at today's card, and it's very much a punting card. So, you mightn't have a, a race like an Epsom, no group ones, but... Uh, you've got the Alan Brown capacity field. You've got a really intriguing three-year-old contest with the Roman Consul, some up-and-coming uh, youngsters in a race uh, like that, and they might be part of an Everest maybe uh, in 12 months' time. So as far as punting goes, plenty of interest, but this is just the entree towards a, a big week next week, and I can't wait to be there on track with you guys. Yeah, well, still, who knows? One of those Roman Consul <coughs> horses may well be in next week's Everest. You never know. Absolutely, yep, three-year-olds, so you've got Osmosis there, he was pretty close to getting a slot, uh, I'm led to believe there were a few conversations behind the scenes, I know Les Bridge absolutely loves Celestial Legend, he's probably more of a, a miler type, and then you've got King's Gambit, uh, who is a horse that has his issues, uh, but he's loaded with talent, so hopefully the penny does drop, but the Roman Consul this year, I think Osmosis, he's a deserved favourite, he was so dominant there in the Heritage Stakes, he just does everything right. I imagine he finds himself outside the lead again. Has to stretch his brilliance to 1,200 metres for the first time, but he's a pretty sensible colt, and on his late strength there last time out, I wouldn't think it's any issue just stretching over a touch further today. Well, let's have a look at your tips for today and a really quality field for this $2 million race. Yeah, so there's quality right across the card, isn't there, Jules? So the Tap Craig, uh, NCAP, uh, I think he's hard enough to beat. The market again has found him. So he's a, a three-year-old with Gary Portelli who uh, has come through the Golden Rose and was only agonisingly touched off uh, for myself and for Connections as well. We nearly landed the, the cash there at double figure eyes, but militarised was a touch too good. He's too well placed today. But that race you speak of, Julie, is, of course, the Hill Stakes, uh, $2 million dollars. 2,000 metres or 1,900 metres, and I think Huyamal, it's a really nice setup for him today. So Gay Wardhouse, Adrian Bott, uh, they could train a rocking horse to victory at the moment. The, the stable is absolutely mm. airborne, uh, winners left, right and centre. And I think there's such a nice sense of timing about him. Out and further, out further ground today, it suits. He's a, a nice stayer, and if he can knock this off, I'm not sure where he finds himself, but maybe down in Melbourne for some big races. Yeah, and uh, Queen of the Ball there in the Nivison. Yeah, I think she's hard to beat. So there's only one obvious leader in this race. So Paracel and Magic Time, the two obvious threats. They've drawn a little bit wide. I don't know where they get to in the run, but you know exactly where Queen of the Ball will be, out in front, high balling. Catch me if you can. There was very little between Queen of the Ball and Paracel two starts ago, with Paracel just getting the verdict. But I don't think there's that much between them uh, in the price, with due respect. So $7 at around that mark, and then Queen of the Ball is going to be hard to chase down. We've seen her since then. Although she was beaten two and a half lengths, it was only by Sunshine in Paris, uh, who unfortunately is not going to make the Tab Everest due to injury, and Espiona, who's come out and won herself, and she has booked a spot. So really nice depth to that form line. I don't think you can go too far wrong having something on coin of the ball each way. I think she'll be right in the finish and give you a real run for your money. So who are your roughies and your best bets for today, Brad? Yeah, my best bet is Huya Mal. So that comes up in race seven, the Hill Stakes. I've been waiting for him to get out to a suitable trip, and we get that today. Uh, Queen of the Ball's hard enough to beat. And the best roughie, I've got Argentia. Uh, so it's in the Alan Brown. Now, capacity field. This is a horse that was heavily backed last time out in the Theo Marks. She found herself outside the lead, and I don't think that necessarily suited her. She raced a touch keen. So today, with the prospect of finding cover, freshened up. She's been back to the trials where she went nicely. I know Joe Pride, the trainer, is bullish about how well this mare is going. Just camps in behind the speed and at double figure odds, I'd be surprised if she doesn't give us a, a run for her money as well. If you can get the crystal ball out, who wins the Everest Ooh. a week out? 
Oh, I don't know. Yeah, this is really hard this year, isn't it? There's no horse that's stood up and said, I deserve to really dominate this race and be favourite. Uh, I wish I win. There's been good support for him throughout the week, and I saw a video there on Twitter that uh, Peter Moody put out, and he looks a million dollars. This has been a long-term plan for him, but out of sight, out of mind. How do you line him up? We haven't seen him for a while. Mm. Uh, think about it. He's the new kid on the block, I guess you could say, despite being a five-year-old. He's at the pointy end of the market because he simply just refuses to lose. So there's a little bit to play out. Could Shinzo bounce back? Maybe. Uh, but we'll wait for the final field uh, and see where we can poke a few holes in the mark mm. because there's bound to be one or two that I think the market's going to miss in such a competitive race. All right, just very, very quickly, one slot remaining for the Everest before Tuesday night's barrier draw. Who are you picking? Just say the name of the horse. We've got no time. Uh, it'll be alcohol free. If it was me, though, I'd love to see Osmosis. There you go, Brad Gray. We will see you on Saturday next week ahead of the $20 million Everest. Thanks, guys. Coffee's on me. Oh, thank you. Pies are on me. Um, <laughs> I know where you get those pies from. That does not count. <laughs> oh, absolutely lovely, yes. Well, we'll be there, trackside, for the richest race on turf, the 2023 running of the Everest. Who will win? Well, flip a coin, but it's going to be a fantastic day. We look forward to it. And, of course, a huge thank you to our sponsors for your support each and every week. We have a huge week ahead of us and a big show next Saturday. Don't forget to join us at 9 o'clock. Have a great day and we'll see you next weekend. Bye. Bye.